This episode is sponsored by Casina. Charlotte Perrian was one of the most gifted and active designers in post-war France. She devoted her entire career to the pursuit of affordable, innovating furnishings, which would improve the lives of millions living in France and in its colonies. Through a vision, ambition, and imagination, Perrian embraced an aesthetic of simplicity that promoted a healthy lifestyle. She was fascinated with new materials and progressive technologies, always merging craft and industry. Passionate about social progress, her contribution to standardization and prefabrication was immense. Machine Age to her was an engine to move modernism from the margins into the mainstream and to grant designers with social responsibility. Always creating, always inventing, her domestic objects came to share the habits of daily life as she sought to unite men with his time and to formulate the concept of French good design. Charlotte Perriand is truly an amazing uh, person in the entire history of modern architecture and design. Uh, as a woman, she was one of the very exceptional women of the 20th century to be a designer. Sure, she was in the front row of all the major events of the 20th century. The uh, article seen in Paris, the emergence of modernism, the post-war reconstruction, the extension of a sphere of modernism to Asia and to, to Brazil. And she could not help herself but be modern. That's how I think of her. And that had a very different uh, presence about them. She has uh, very, very uh, uh, unique shapes. The unique oeuvre, which is based on the idea of of comfort, of usefulness. Extremely well built as an architect. And at the same time, he's extremely graceful and acknowledges and develops modern technologies. Her autobiography, which she published at the age of 95, tells the story of her global life before the era of globalization. The people, the places, the events of her seven decade magnificent career. The recently published trilogy, Catalogue Raisonné, Charlotte Perrian Complete Works by Jacques Bursac, is the most ambitious and substantial survey of Perrian's work to date. Charlotte Perrian has left a gigantic archive in Paris, an archive in which one finds photographs, uh, drawings, uh, correspondence with many people. And this archive was, uh, until recently, only partially known. So the new oeuvre complete, the new complete works compiled by Jacques Barzac are really opening a new age in which one discovers, I wouldn't say the secrets because there are still secrets to discover, but one discovers the daily life of Charlotte, one uh, understands her relationship with patrons, uh, architects, friends, institutions. One sees how her life unfolds in parallel to her, uh, to her creativity and many myths are dispelled. Uh, Charlotte appears as a much more complex, creative, and also a touching uh, human being. Marianne believed that architecture and well-designed furniture had the power to transform people's lives and to pave the way to a better world. She conceptualized furniture just like architecture. She was foremost an interior designer and as such considered furniture to be integral to the overall design scheme. Her search for affordable, functional, mass-produced furniture either made in industry or by hand and her belief in interdisciplinary teamwork resulted in some of the greatest partnerships in the history of modern design. With Le Corbusier, Pierre Jeanneret, Jean Prouvé, Fernand Léger, Perian took on the mission of intersecting modern design with a new economic prosperity of the post-war era. First with Le Corbusier, it was a kind of uh, admiration at the beginning because she was uh, very young when she started working with him. And it was something, she was, I think, 25 years old, so it was uh, very uh, exceptional for uh, a woman uh, 
uh, so young to work with somebody already very well known. Of course, after I think that the people like Pierre Genre was closer from her, and Jean Prouvé has also a very uh, specific kind of relation. I think they're part of the DNA of our family. They were there very early, but initially we bought these uh, tables and desks uh, purely for the sake of living with them, and there was no true collecting um, idea behind it. it. It was it was meant to be objects upon which uh, our boys could do their homework or we could eat at the table. And the moments that we shared around these various objects will always remain with us as we look at these objects again. They're not disposable objects. They're really um, entities that will remain and hopefully will go down the generations. In the years following the Second World War, Perianne worked closely with Jean Prouvé to create groundbreaking and avant-garde furniture, which was fresh, young, stylish, optimistic, and affordable. Their signature style was a direct reflection of their socialist sensibilities, of their commitment to industry, and of Prouvé's pioneering technology of bent sheet metal. 1930s, she already thought about like human body structures. Like example, when she designed day bed or chairs, she were very much like focusing on which angle of body is greening back to the chair that could be very comfortable. It's because she thought about the design could change better life. And furthermore, she believed that is change for uh, human societies, you know. It's not only the, you know, certain classes, high classes or mid classes. She would like to produce mass, mass productions of her pieces could everybody could use to better life that, you know, uh, people could enjoy this. Anybody could enjoy these furniture. These pieces that she created in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s were quite affordable in the Paris flea markets well into the 90s when Perriand was hardly known outside of France. I mean, there was a small market, but it was nothing like it, like it became or is today. Um, you could find things which was difficult, and you could find huge volume of things. You could find suites of dining chairs, you could find her lights. And, you know, she also did, she had such large commissions where she did hundreds of pieces for different projects and then they would suddenly just deaccess them or sell them or something changed. And so things came on the market, I think, in big waves of volume. And then in the early 90s, we, I've had for many years, I don't own it anymore, but for over 27 years, I had a home on the beach in Fire Island. and. My late partner, Jed, he brought uh, a great suite of Perion chairs to the house. The rush chairs. Yeah, the rush chairs. And they were quite, uh, they had a simplicity about them, which, which worked in the house. And then they had this soft um, uh, carved arms that almost felt like bones or something. You know, they had a, kind of, they had a feeling in the raffia and they just felt to me so completely natural in this house on the beach. And um, at that point, then, I began collecting a lot more of her material. Uh, in New York, we would spend a lot of time at uh, 1950, the, the Lorenzo store. It was on Lafayette Street, a big loft. And it would be a place where we would go almost every week just to sit down, look at the furniture, and appreciate uh, the various objects that were there. The market was not so hot that things were going out of the room very quickly. So you had time to spend a long while with each object and then decide if you wanted to, uh, to buy this or not. Pieces were affordable, but they were still expensive. And in that respect, every purchase was a bit of a sacrifice. But that was something that my wife Nina and I were willing to do because we felt that it was important enough to have this kind of furniture in our life on, on a regular basis that we were willing to probably not own a secondary home at the beach like a lot of my peers had, 
and instead just concentrate on what we had in our first house and enjoy the benefits of, of that beauty, basically. I thought about it, you know, a long time ago, that I have to organize this, the group exhibition or individual show of one of each, like, French modern avant-garde designers to Korea. So, uh, 2007 was actually, I found the exhibition in Korea uh, of Charles Perignon, and that was incredibly successful. Three museum retrospectives in the 90s cemented Perianne's reputation. After her death in 1999, the furniture she designed in the post-war years has gradually become blue chip in the international marketplace. Her colorful bookcases, freeform tables, wooden benches, plastic laminated sideboards, storage units, and the iconic three-legged stools have all been taken out of the original, often socialist context, to beautify some of the most sophisticated homes of the 21st century across the globe. It was not a matter of price, it was a matter of interest. Nobody was interested with nothing. So it was the price. Today, the people think in terms of price, like uh, with, there is a big uh, difference between the prices uh, 30 years ago and today. But the prices 30 years ago were n not real because even it was not the price it was paid by the people uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. So when the market started, which is uh, let's say 20 years ago, of course you created a, a market with collectors and the price are uh, growing. So the price are coming to the point of uh, what it cost and after, of course, it's, it's becoming a, something of a collection, which is after a matter of offer and demand. If Sharpen would live today, it would be very surprised because there wasn't main concepts that, you know, she making a very expensive, high-end piece of furniture. But reality is right now is very collectible, very rare pieces. So I, I assume she will be very surprised <laughs> of the market that uh, how much it, it goes up and up and up. Charlotte Perriand was the princess of the French design avant-garde movement from the very beginning. Her glorious career began at the prestigious atelier of Le Corbusier in the 20s. During a productive decade working collaboration with a legend and his cousin Pierre Genere, she was responsible for designing the office's interiors and furnishings. Le Corbusier's aesthetic vision and mantra that the house is a machine for living in left an imprint on Perriand and would ultimately influence and shape her entire career. From him, she learned the imagery of the machine, the power of simplicity, the magic of using humble materials in creating rich design and ultimately how to turn a dream into reality. She shared Le Corbusier's opinion that the upholstered chair was a relic of the past and embraced his vision of utilizing new materials in favor of the woods, wallpaper, and drapes. Perriand is mostly remembered for a series of chairs and tables made out of chromed and lacquered steel tubing, which she designed during her time with Le Corbusier. Steel, she said, was not simply a utilitarian material that belonged exclusively in hospitals or restaurants, but could be used in domestic, sophisticated, and stylish homes. She created pieces that were revolutionary, not only for signaling progress, but also in breaking down barriers of traditional gender-specific furniture. They were first produced by Tonnet, then the world's largest manufacturer of bentwood furniture, but with a lack of interest in the rather too ahead of its time furniture, they became an economic failure. Charlotte Perriand worked for some 10 years, uh, roughly, in the atelier of Le Corbusier. Uh, related to Le Corbusier, but much closer, in fact, to Le Corbusier's partner and cousin, Pierre Jalleret, who was really the office manager and the partner on which uh, all the production rested. She took part to many projects, so in the archive of Le Corbusier there are many drawings that can be attributed to her, not necessarily her design, so she had 
contribution which remains to be measured and we only now realize that she has been very active in projects usually credited to Le Corbusier and Jalleret. She has of course been a central figure in the production of furniture and the, in the design of interiors, but uh, her contribution appears now thanks to the complete works co uh, written by Jacques Barzac to be uh, a much wider one than uh, usually acknowledged. Beginning in 1958, Heidi Weber, the Zurich-based interior designer, produced the line, and in 1964, she sub-licensed her ride to Casina, which has produced the furniture ever since. For the chaise longue, she created a seat molded to the human body in one simple curve. A special edition of the chaise longue called LC4CP is produced today by Cassina in collaboration with Louis Vuitton. Immediately after leaving the atelier of Le Corbusier in 1937, Perian started moving from metal into wood, which marked a turning point in her career. She was drawn to natural and traditional materials when reinterpreting her wooden straw chairs and when creating her first freeform table out of pine beams. Trees are only beautiful in the raw form, she declared. Well, the freeform table to me, the one that in particular I lived with, was very, uh, I thought it was very experimental. It had a slight crudeness to it. It was sophisticated. It was very high concept, but very, it, I mean, I guess I would say it's high concept and low, ex, low execution. Does that make sense? So it was sort of, Absolutely. it was very, very powerful idea, but not necessarily made so perfectly. That was one side of it. But the more relevant side, I think, is that it's a very democratic table. It's non-hierarchical. Does that make sense? Yes. You know, so there's not a there's not somebody who's going to sit at the head of the table. There's not somebody who's secondary. So it, it's a, it's a there's a there's an implied democracy about the table that I think is I loved it because I could sit anywhere I wanted to around it. The difference of uh, the furniture made originally, of course, uh, is uh, because it was made. It was not a mass production. It was not something produced by someone else. It was always something done by uh, somebody that Charlotte Perriand knew or it was a special order. So she was more uh, concerned, I would say, by the, by the object directly. And also she, it was something which was not big mass production, but it was something yeah, that you can order from a, a gallery where you can enter in and ask uh, for a table who could fit in your uh, personal uh, dimension. So it's something a little bit different. Originally, it's really a project like uh, if you do something, like uh, if you create uh, a total uh, concept for an interior. And after, it was more something like a piece of furniture well known that you order. So it's, of course, there is a difference. Also, a difference in terms of fabrication. I'm not sure, but uh, originally, the quality of the fabrication was always better but it was more rough, it was more simple. And after, when it was made in the 50s, it was made by real, uh, by professional uh, wood worker with some technique which were more uh, well known. So it was something maybe more uh, refined, but with this uh, little thing uh, less of, uh, that you, we, every collector liked to find on a piece of furniture, I mean something which is not perfect, but which gives the originality of the piece. This freeform table actually um, is a piece that we bought knowing that we had no place for it. And we were fortunate enough many years later, actually just a few years ago, to link two apartments together and um, therefore had suddenly more room and that table, which had been dormant, uh, finally reappeared, much to our pleasure. And um, the table has taken a uh, position of almost a sculptural entity within the house. There are not too many chairs around them. Usually I like to leave just one chair. And I see it more as a desk or a place of reflection. It's a place where I go and if I have to write a letter or something meaningful, 
I would do it on that particular table. It has a thickness that is um, very special and, and, and a resonance from its uh, polish that's almost like honey that actually just seems very soothing to the soul and it's just um, somewhat magical. So I don't know how to, I don't want to wax lyrical about a piece of wood, but at the end of the day, there is something quite uh, spectacular about that object. The freeform tables is, is amazing pieces for me and as well as like people who love Perian pieces. The freeform is kind of an uh, icon in the pieces, I think. It's because the shapes and the way it supports the tops, the three legs, it, it's, it's incredibly like beautiful sculptures and it, it just has a lot of character into it. So it depends how these people wants to use these pieces in the interior pieces. It always going to be melt and it's it just unbelievably beautiful pieces that is going to go with the others is together very well. The free form has uh, uh, the shapes are every Freeform table has a different uh, types of wood. Some freeform table made out of oak, some tables made out of mahogany, but and also the thicknesses are different. It all depends, you know, because when freeform designed it from the Steph Simon, and like it depends which people order with uh, uh, what kind of you know, uh, material they wanted to pick, it, it, it could go for twice thicker than normal thick, I should say four inches, then maybe, or four to eight inches sometimes. So it, it, that give the character of how special the free form that in that time could want it to be ordered from Step Simon. The war caught Perian in Japan, where she in, was invited by the Ministry of Commerce to advise on how to make better products for export to the West. She fell in love with the Japanese domestic culture and the design aesthetic. The uniformity, proportion, and standardization of the architecture and the concept of the built-in storage the unique costumes and materials of wood, straw, rice paper, lacquer, and bamboo. She was moved by the unique interrelationship between interior and exterior and by the comfort and purity of simplicity over decorative excess. The Japanese art of living would become fully integrated in her work later on. Not a color to disturb the tone of the room, not a sound to mark the rhyme of things she wrote on the magical imperial villa of Katsura. Uh, Charlotte's relationship to Japan is a very rich one, a very complex one. First she brought from Europe, from Paris to Japan, her uh, ideas and her forms and she had a great role in shaping uh, Japanese modernist culture. Then she brought back uh, to Paris where she worked but also to other places, I'm thinking of the uh, mountain resorts she designed in the 60s. She brought a sense of the economy of space, a sense of abstraction, a sense uh, of a directness in the use of natural materials, which uh, I think changed very much the design scene in the Western world. Uh, interestingly, she transcoded or transformed using material materials such as bamboo, design which had uh, initially been made for steel tubes. So I think her work is really a remarkable uh, displacement of uh, modernism. It's not Japanese culture that goes west with her. It's a Japanese culture informed by modernism which reshapes modernism uh, uh, on the way back. Influenced by the aesthetic of uh, Japan. Minimalism, simplicity, very uh, simple but also very precise way of working on the wood. Sure. She made something more refined and all the details were suddenly totally included in this uh, perfection of uh, realization. When Japan joined the war as a German ally, Perrin was unable to go back to France. She ended up living out the rest of the war in Vietnam, where she met Jacques Martin, a military officer, and married him in 1943. Her only daughter, Pernay, was born in Vietnam. 
Charles Perrian produced her hallmark designs in the period right after the Second World War. During the war, she devoted the time to research and discovery. After the war was the time for action, in her words. She opened her own atelier in Paris and became involved with a variety of projects, including Le Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation, his milestone mass housing complex in Marseille. In his self-contained city for the 20th century consumer society, Perian crafted the prototype of the perfect family dwelling, spacious, private, and full of sunlight, with an open kitchen bar integrated into the living room and a separation between children's and parents' bedrooms. With this project, Perian put her trademark on the way people across the globe came to live in the post-war decades. Built between 1946 and 52, the Unité d'Habitation by Le Corbusier uh, put together 337 apartments, and Charlotte was present in each of them in various ways. She worked on the design of the uh, cupboards, of the main uh, pieces of built-in furniture. She designed the kitchen, which is a remarkable achievement in compactness and elegance, a kitchen which is open onto the living room and is not uh, a closet in which the housewife uh, is secluded. She also worked uh, at designing uh, specific pieces of furniture that were shown together with the entire uh, system at the Paris uh, Exhibition of Reconstruction in 47. In short, the interior landscape of uh, each of the Unité's apartment owes very much to Charlotte. In 1952, Perian signed a collaboration agreement with the Atelier Jean Prouvé, which stipulated her responsibilities for approving the aesthetic and practical aspects of Prouvé's line, as well as supplying new designs for the factory production. You have a special love for the three-legged stool, and you've got lots of them. What do you love about it? It's powerful. Of these early ones is just a finite number of them and uh, each one of them has its own personality, its own character. I like the stool uh, conceptually as a very low stool because it brings you down to the ground so it kind of grounds you in a certain way. But it's also a very humble um, instrument. It, it evokes the, uh, the milking stools that people use in the farms and because it's quite simply made, it also evokes aspects of simplicity in life which we often don't have and which we're devoid of. Um, as my uh, oldest son went to college, um, I gave him actually a stool to take to his college dorm. And I told him, you know, it's, these are three-legged stools, and I also like the fact that as you sit on them, there's somewhat of an imbalance. So once again, it's about the human condition. You have to be grounded, but yet you are somewhat not in balance, and you have to remain humble. So those are some of the aspects I wanted him to take uh, to school with him. And because we're a family of four, I uh, told him that the three legs of that stool were the three remaining members of the family that would be there with him while he was away and so forth. This is made out of uh, mahogany, so it's kind of heavy, but what it gives the, uh, uh, has a feeling is that it, it just, when you, you, when you turn around, the legs are not really straight. You see the little like curves, so that's kind of a uh, uh, Perian's shapes that I was mentioned earlier. Even legs, it's not really straight, it's, it's slightly curved. And uh, the wood behind, I mean, wood underneath has the kind of characters that, you know, how much it ages. And it just, when you hold it, it's mahogany, especially mahogany too, has a very like kind of heaviness that, that is just, give you the character of this, how old that is. And then the other one is actually different material that he makes. It's, uh, it's oak, so a little lighter than this, but uh, same technique. But like, you know, every stool has a 
slightly different shapes, but this is a little thinner than the mahogany, the one that I showed you first, but it's slightly like thinner compared to the, uh, the first one, but still it has like same round shapes and the uh, turning around has like kind of, you know, how much it ages. I had a three-legged stool at that desk, which was a triangle. It wasn't round like this. It was actually a triangle. And I loved it because I had a bench and I had two triangulated stools, triangle stools, and I could compose them in different ways. You could, you know, they had a, they had a freedom about how you could, you could put the stools at the end of the bench. You could use the bench more. They were very um, spontaneous. And that's what I think the three-legged stool is. It's Spontaneous a, yeah. is a great word, but also powerful. And yeah. What makes them powerful? I think probably because they work despite your, your, in, your first reaction is, is that they're going to fall over. They're not going to be stable. There's something that is dis, it, it, it works against our, our instincts, our rationality, that they'll, you can sit at them, but they do. So I think that also gives them a power. Sometimes things that work despite their appearance can be very powerful. This collaboration birthed various projects, including the dormitories of Maison de Tunis and Maison de Mexique at the student housing of the City University of Paris. The innovative bookcases Perian designed for this project have since become milestones of modern design and among the most sought after items by design collectors. Uh, furniture, especially the bookcases, uh, some tables, some uh, objects to furnish the Maison de la Tunisie, Maison du Mexique, uh, Maison du Brésil. All these houses were uh, mostly uh, furnished by uh, Charlotte Perriot. You know, the normal bookshelf, you only use for one side. But the, this Mexique, the Perriot design is actually, you could use the both, both sides. That's the kind of uh, uh, the unique design. And it has a lot of color, com different colors put together as a make one Mexique. It's a beautiful kind of sculptures. The bookcases for Maison de Tunis rested on concrete slabs set against the wall, and all of the color combination were polychromed by Sonia Delaunay, another important figure in the French avant-garde. The bookcases for Maison de Mexique were set on the ground and utilized as both storage units and screens that divided the bedrooms and the shower rooms. I, I had the opportunity to buy those pieces like the bookshelf of Charlotte Perriand or some table by Prouvé, because most of the people who had them in the university don't want them anymore because it was not practical, it was not in good condition, it was not fitting in the new way of living of the students and the places. So it was not, uh, not difficult, it was for me a pleasure. The difficulty was, was more to to be able to collect all those things because there were many and uh, I didn't know what to do about uh, with all, so many pieces. But I was absolutely convinced that it was something really uh, important to, to collect even if it had no value at this time. In 1953, Perianne left for Tokyo again and two years later she mounted a show at the Takashimaya department store called The Synthesis of the Arts. She integrated furniture with fine art and displayed paintings by Le Corbusier, tapestries and sculptures by Fernand Leger, ceramics by Picasso. For this installation, Perian designed a free-form bookcase for the first time, which was largely inspired by shelves in the shape of clouds she first saw at the 17th century Katsura Imperial Villa in Kyoto. Another masterpiece was her shadow chair, one of the most beautiful chairs of the 20th century. Um, it's very interesting, the name, it, it's shadow, that it gives it something very simple. It could be a piece of sculpture or it could be a, an object. Originally, in Japan, it was made uh, in a way a little bit more resistant than it was made later. And that's the reason why there were very few uh, still existing made originally in Japan and after the, the one made in France were thinner and were not capable to resist so much. Most of them were broken. But this chair for me is really the, the, the image of uh, something which is now in the middle of uh, 
uh, our preoccupation in design, it's this relation between art and design. Perrin's collaboration with Jean Prouvé did not end when he lost the control of his factory in 1954. With the opening of the Steph Simon Gallery, the two worked together to mount exhibitions and design new works, marking a new chapter in their careers. Perian became the gallery's art director and designed its interior. Whereas Prevent Perian previously aimed for mass production, they introduced a customized and craft-driven approach in the pieces shown at the gallery. When Charlotte Perian started working with Steph Simon, she mm -hmm. moved away from standardization into more custom work right. and more luxurious pieces. So right. she really translated her language into something that was more for you know beautiful homes mm -hmm. rather than for universities or hospitals and what what which do you like those pieces yes, I, do. I mean what do you think what do you think that transformation made to her legacy well i think it was an important transformation because i think it showed her versatility number one I think also that it's a little, I think at that point in her life, she was sort of what, mid-50s, early 60s when she started it. She was definitely in a mid-career moment and her, let's just say like her design DNA was established. I mean, she knew who she was and I think, suspect she was very comfortable. But I thought, because I love the question and I thought of sort of a funny answer to it because I thought of uh, other really protean women in the 20th century and who came to mind was ironically Jane Fonda who you know was married to Roger Vadim and then she was married to uh, Tom Hayden who was a huge political activist you know and they had this kind of hard life because they were politically active and they had to always be perceived of as being politically relevant and then she marries Ted Turner who's a billionaire you know so I think sometimes you you know you eat rice and beans and then you want to have a steak I mean you know you you know, life it's is, the life best is, answer <laughs> I could expect. <laughs> but life is always about, people always assume that you're going to just wear like a monk's cowl and walk. I mean, I think, I think that someone in her life or in her lifetime who really s struggled with so many issues to suddenly have an opportunity to be funded and to be given the chance to work with very beautiful things enlarges those things. It makes them better. Steph Simon was uh, a man uh, originally uh, very uh, preoccupied by the, the cr new creation. And at this time, he met uh, Charlotte Perrion and he was uh, totally convinced that it was, she was the woman to take care of his gallery, to organize the whole uh, decoration and the, the, even the choice of the artist in the gallery. The people I met who knew him and the people who are still alive today, told me that it was a place where it was more than a, a furniture gallery. It was a gallery of uh, uh, a kind of uh, meeting point of artists, uh, creators, uh, all kind of people interested in Saint-Germain-des-Prés at this time of the creation, but also in uh, theater, uh, movies, everything. So I remember that uh, I, I read in the archive that uh, Brigitte Bardot was coming, but also Gérard Philippe, but some famous architect. But so many, many people of Saint-Germain-des-Prés were interested in, in this gallery. Simone salvaged Perian's design from Maxville, informing the new owners who overtook Prouvé's factory that as a result of his departure, they no longer had the right to produce her designs. The gallery became the sole distributor of Jean Prouvé and Charlotte Perian's furniture, which was shown at the gallery along with Noguchi lanterns. The differences of uh, the production of Steph Simon and the uh, and the other production, it was that when she, uh, some university has uh, ordered something like a bookcase to Charlotte Perrion, a table by Prouvé, it, it was something which is absolutely unique and specially made for this place. And normally it was not made for somebody else. So it gave to this uh, type of furniture an historical uh, quality that uh, you don't find in a piece uh, which was not uh, part of this commission. The public and the clients has sl uh, slowly moved to uh, something which is not 
absolutely unique, but which belong to part of uh, an history. So now she has to give satisfaction to her clients. So example, like this uh, word or uh, cabinets, as of how much it thick has, thinness is, is, and the material is mahogany. Steph Simon produced Perian's wall lights and helped her to produce plastic drawers using the injection mold methods. And these drawers were sold through BHV. When Simon's gallery closed in 1974, the remaining stock went to the mail order form. A few years before she died, she came to New York and she uh, received an award here and then there was a lecture and then there was a little dinner and I attended everything that she did when she was here. But what I loved was it was all about the present. It was all about today. It wasn't, so here was a woman in her mid-90s who was really not reflecting on the past at all, which I think is what most of the people wanted. What she was interested in is was what were people doing today? And so as I've matured, I don't really I mean, the past is always interesting and you have to know the past, but I think the future is really where everything is at. It's not my world to make. I made it. Whatever I did 20 years ago was that world, or 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It's now what a young person makes of this world. That's what's interesting. It's, it's amazing that for me to living with her pieces for many years in these houses, that it never get boring, never get tired, and always like, you know, I get into the room and it's welcoming it. it it's incredible. Like. You could call it love at first sight. It would be love for that object, for that stool. That's the one that really uh, started drawing us into a different type of furniture. She was also capable to, to be uh, herself in this men's world, which is, in my opinion, very uh, important. So Charlotte has... Uh, uh, introduced a novel way of looking at technologies which were however too essentially used. Perianch forged her own path within the modern movement, making an immense contribution to shaping of French industrial modernity. Her legacy was enriched by her travels, by her love for nature and meditation, and by her extraordinary talent. Since 1999, the value of her furniture has been steadily climbing, and collectors from all over the world have discovered the simplicity and sophistication of her furniture. 2013 was a particularly important year. A prefabricated beach house that Perian designed in 1934 was finally constructed, and Louis Vuitton's spring collection was inspired by her designs. Today, the demand for furniture has grown tremendously, and her place in the international marketplace has never been stronger.